Welcome back to the swamp my friends. It's good to see you made it back for another episode. Today is going to be an extra long episode as I compile some of the creepiest and strange stories from the deep woods sent in by viewers just like you. As always, if you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit your story at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I'd love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. It's stories like yours that help keep this show going on a daily basis. Hey everyone, just as a quick reminder, or for those who may not have heard, I have joined the Chilling family, and I want to make sure you take advantage of the free trial if you haven't yet. Chilling is the new home of horror, an amazing mobile app that allows you to do things that are just not possible on YouTube. With hundreds of amazing stories that are sorted and curated into playlists, or you can create your own, we give you so much flexibility to listen the way you want. This includes a chilling exclusive feature, our ambient menu. Change the background noise of the story that will fit your mood. It is an absolute game changer. Of course, this is offered completely and totally ad free. That's right, no ads. Just hours upon hours of uninterrupted, horrifying, creepy, and all around spooky content. New narrators have recently been added as well, as well as classic novels, vintage horror radio, and true crime. There is also the new addition of a sleep timer. They've updated the user interface with greater detail, the ability to see what stories you've already listened to, and a recent story section. Start your free trial today with the link in the description. And it's only $2.99 per month after that. Completely ad-free. And right now, now, during the month of August, we are giving away an Xbox Series X bundle. Check out more details in the description down below. This experience I'm going to describe has taken a while for me to get together and finally write down and send into the show. I have experienced a few paranormal things, but this is probably the craziest one of them all. It takes place in Yosemite National Park in August of 2017 with my two best friends Zach and Andrew. Zach had worked that summer as a parking agent at Glacier Point and was familiar with the area. The employee housing, he was given a house in Wawona with two other guys. Andrew and I were visiting for the week, and we each had been to Yosemite before. One of the nights there, we decided to watch over the sunset over at Chonana Falls. It was a great hike that Zach had done before. The trail was about four miles to the top with about 2,000 foot elevation gain. We brought food and decided to hike up and take a swim and eat at the pool on top of the falls. We set out a couple of hours before sunset. As we approached the top portion, we were about a half mile to the top of the falls, where a guy, about our age, early 20s, ran up to us from the bushes frantically asking for help. His friend had apparently fallen 50 feet off of a cliff and had shattered their femur. Zach was used to this, after working in the park all summer, he had seen many injuries and was used to this kind of thing. The man didn't have cell reception, but I did, so I called 911 and reported the incident, requesting search and rescue. After a few minutes, we decided we wanted to continue the hike after search and rescue assured us they would be there soon with the helicopter. We told the guy help was on the way, and we continued the next half mile up to the top of the falls. When we finally got up there, it was a picture-perfect scene. A beautiful sunset as we swam and ate. We then got a pretty amazing show as we saw the helicopter land to pick up the injured guy we had encountered right below us. I'm a private pilot and Air Force aviator, so I loved every second of watching the helicopter land on the mountainside. After the sunset, we began to hike down and past the spot where the injured guy and search and rescue team were taking care of him. We had a brief encounter with them. They thanked us for calling it in. It was not dark out, and we continued the hike down. There was not much moonlight. It was dark, so we used our phones as flashlights to see the trail. This is where the story truly gets interesting. The top of the hike was switchbacks with a steep incline on the right, and a steep decline on the left, with shrubs and trees and all kinds of stuff. It was too steep to hike down, hence the switchbacks. About one mile into the hike down, 
Zach was in front with a light. I was second also shining my light, and Andrew was in the back. Zach was shining his light ahead and saw something sticking out from behind a tree that was about 15 feet ahead, just off to the right of the path, and instinctively shine the light at it. That's when whatever it was exposed itself in the tree and ran across the path, down to the left, and down the steep grade. It ran on two feet, and resembled some sort of humanoid. It was a little shorter than us, and very clearly had two arms and two legs, but it moved in an inhuman way. It kind of resembled a person. It had a head and its limbs appeared to be just skin, no clothes or anything. We all three saw it, and stopped dead in our tracks. We continued shining the light from where it ran, down the left side of the mountain, but we didn't see anything after it ran down. We were terrified, none of us really knowing what to say, because we had no idea what we really saw. The worst part was that we had another three mile hike down, and a mile and a half to the trailhead. Then we still had to go to Zach's house, all while knowing this creature could be stalking us and be near. Luckily we made it to Zach's house, all without being harmed. Whatever it was must have just been there to scare us or something. My question is, is if anybody else has had any similar experience in this area. I've done some research, and my best guess would be a skimwalker or something like that, but it didn't try to lure us into the forest with it. We have had subsequent experiences a couple of years later in Tioga Pass, right outside of the Tioga Gate. We were camping in a closed campground in Tioga. In the middle of the night, I woke up to use the bathroom, and before exiting the tent, I saw what looked like an orb about five feet from the tent, floating across. It was a bright light, but when I shined my light on it, there was nothing holding it. I don't think it was a person. I honestly don't. None of my friends have any ideas for what it is, and I have no idea either. I'd love to hear any suggestions in the comments, though. My name is Rob. I'm a 37-year-old avid hiker. The following incident happened 10 years ago. My love for nature had been with me since childhood. It became so strong I took a job working summers at Yosemite while I attended college. I did consider applying for a permanent job after school, but that was not to be. My life pushed me into an entirely different direction, but I'm still happy where I ended up. My decision to go into education gave me the opportunity to expand the minds of the young, but still have a large amount of time off to explore and enjoy the outdoors. The best of both worlds, as they would say. The week in which this story unfolded was just like any other summer week. I had taken a five-mile hike the month prior, and my family and I had a week-long camping trip scheduled for the last week before the start of the fall semester. The early part of the week had been taken up by the casual errands and small tasks to do around the house, but I knew that by Thursday, the remaining two days would be free to do whatever we wanted. When Thursday morning came around, I made the kids breakfast and once they finished, they scattered around the neighborhood to hang out with their friends. Being at the age that they could take care of themselves, 14 and 16 respectively, I was now free to do whatever I wanted now, I had this one last week to take our dog, lady, and myself for hikes in the hills outside of town. My wife worked into at least five every day, so I called to let her know what my plans were for the day. The call went to her voicemail, which was not really an odd thing considering she was a psychologist and more than likely was with a patient when I called. Anytime I went on my long walks or my hikes, whatever you choose to call it, I made sure to leave her as much information about where I would be going as I could, so she would know when to expect me, or when to send help if I never come home. This is something everyone should do when they are going out into the outdoors. It's the smart thing to do. Anyway, with that taken care of, I grabbed my small pack and my dog's lead. Her name is Lady. We loaded up and headed out of town. We arrived at the park just before 10 a.m., and as far as I could tell, we were the only people really in the area. I hooked Lady up and let her out of the car. I threw on my pack and we headed down the trail. Once I was out of sight of the road, I stopped to take out my 38. 
I placed it on my holster and tucked it into my waistband. I do have a concealed carry weapon permit. I started carrying a pistol a few years ago. This happened when I came across a drug deal behind a grocery store and had a gun pulled on me. I was led to believe that I was about to die. I'm not sure if the guy was serious, but if I'm ever in a spot like that again, I'd like to at least be able to have even odds. But that's a story for another time. Lady and I had been hiking for about 10 minutes when we came to a blind corner. We were walking uphill, and we were unable to see what was on top of the hill. I had been out here before. I have hiked Yosemite many, many times, actually. But it had been several years since I came to this particular spot, and I could not remember which way the trail led. The only reason that this mattered at all was that Lady's behavior was getting weird as we neared the top of the hill. She had stopped and raised her head and began intensely sniffing the air. Since she had never done this before, I was unsure of whether she was smelling or what she was doing. But within a minute or so, she lowered her head back and started walking as usual. It was a head scratcher, but I wrote it off as regular dog funniness. At the top of the hill, I noticed that the trail split off into two directions. To the right and straight ahead, so I stopped to ponder in which direction we would go. I took the opportunity to take a drink from my bottle and poured some into my hand for Lady. She had three handfuls and I put the bottle back into my backpack. The plan was to go straight ahead to decrease the chance of getting lost. As I said, it had been quite a while since I had last been on this particular trail, so I was erring on the side of safety. In the future, we would take the right fork and explore. We had plenty of time left. If we didn't make it this year, we could make it out some other time. Well, once we had slacked our thirst, Lady and I continued ahead. We had only managed a few more steps before an uproar occurred behind me. Looking back, I saw Lady was in full battle mode with a medium-sized dog. I began striking at the other dog with my walking stick, trying not to hit Lady. It was obvious that she was fighting for her life. Being a Cocker Spaniel, she didn't stand much of a chance against this larger dog, but I was darn sure that I wasn't going to let this mutt kill her. I kept swinging at the dog until one of the swings finally made a solid hit. It recoiled back for a second, and at first, I thought it was going to run off. This was when I got my first clear look at it and realized that this was no dog. This was a coyote. Unfortunately, rather than running away, it began approaching us again, but this time in a much more measured way. I could tell it was making the judgment as to whether it should attack or not. I'd had enough of this, and I wasn't going to give it a chance. I drew my pistol and shot it. It let out a short yelp and turned around to run, but dropped dead before it could take one step. My priority was to check on Lady. She was pretty bloody, but the only wounds that I could see were two deep puncture holes on the back of her neck and a deep tear to her leg. We were both really shaken up and I held her while I sat there and stared at the dead coyote. It took a few moments to get myself together, but once I did, I picked up Lady and ran to my car, where I had left my phone. I called the police and the animal control people, and they arrived in about 10 minutes. The police had been notified by the dispatcher that I was a concealed carry weapon holder, and I left my pistol on my front seat so they could examine it for whatever they might need to do under these circumstances. But once they were able to confirm that the coyote had only one wound and I had just fired one round in my gun, that was as far as they really took things. While I waited for the cops, I raided my first aid kit for bandages to treat Ludie's wounds, at least in the best way I could until I got her to the vet. I quickly led them to the body of the coyote and they released me so I could take her to the vet. Luckily, the clinic found no other wounds on her. Once she was cleaned up, all it took was 20 staples and some bandages. However, they followed this good news up with bad news that she would have to be kept in quarantine for 10 days to be observed for signs of rabies. I was not overly concerned, but rabies is something that can happen. And she had just got a new shot two months prior though, so hopefully she'll be alright. The worst part would be having to explain to the family that she would be away for all that time. She was a very important part of the family and she had doubtlessly been upset herself. She had never spent a single day without us. During Lady's 10 days away, the investigation took place. The police were satisfied with my description of the attack 
and closed their part of the case. Apparently, it came out in some media soon after that that the coyote had been chasing and stalking multiple joggers, and one report stated that a local resident's dog had been ripped through their chain fence by this same coyote. The animal control department notified me that the coyote did not have rabies, and after the 10-day period, Lady got to go home. She certainly seemed happy to see us, and I can guarantee that we were all overjoyed to see her. After a few follow-ups, she was given a clean bill of health, and she was completely healed up in three months. There is one lingering effect on the attack, however. When I take her on walk, she spends a lot of time looking behind her to make sure there is no other animal that can sneak up on her. The fact is, if I'm being honest, I'm a little jumpy on walks myself, so I can't really blame her. When it's all said and done, respect nature, whether it's in Yosemite National Park or anywhere else in the world. Hi, this happened around August of this year. I'm not sure what we experienced or if there was anything paranormal about it, but here it goes. It's also a bit of a long story, so I do apologize for that. So this took place while we were hiking up to Half Dome. We had a campground about 20 minutes drive away from the trailhead, and the group was composed of me, an 18-year-old male, my uncle, a 32-year-old male, and my uncle's friend, I'll call him D. There were also two girls with us, but they're not really relevant to the story. My uncle and his friend are both Christian, so there were no substances consumed that could induce the feelings that I will be talking about. We get to our campsite, set up camp, and go to sleep after eating. We plan to wake up at 4 a.m. and start the hike by 4.30. I randomly wake up at 3.30 a.m., completely wide awake and ready to go. I look out of my hammock, and I remember feeling this odd feeling, as if I were woken up by something. And I remember looking out at the moonlight scene. The moon was very bright for some reason, and thinking to myself, it looks like a dream. I lay back down in my hammock, but just cannot go back to sleep. I end up waking up my uncle and our friend at about 3.50 a.m. My uncle says, Were you walking around last night? I say no and ask him why. He says he woke up for some reason and can hear someone walking around. Not like an animal, but a person. I say, huh, that's weird, and we try to brush it off. We get to the trailhead at around 4.30 a.m., and as everyone is unloading from the car, Dee says he's going to use the bathroom, which there are a couple before the trailhead. I walk behind him for some time, before falling behind and waiting for my uncle, who forgot something in the car. The short, straight road from the parking lot runs directly into a T-intersection with the road to the trailhead. The bathroom is directly across on the intersection through the field. Those who have been here know exactly what I'm talking about. We get to the intersection and wait for D to come out of the bathroom. We wait for about 10 minutes before I go back and check the bathroom. He isn't there. I get back to my uncle and tell him that. He says, weird, maybe he went back to the car or something. We decide to wait a little bit more. By 5.10 we begin to worry. My uncle goes to check the car while I wait at the intersection to make sure we don't miss him if he went down the road away from the trailhead. My uncle returns and says he's not there either. We decide maybe he went up to the trailhead without us, for some reason, and walk up there in about 10 minutes. He isn't there either. We are kind of baffled now, because there are no other logical places he could have went. I decide to run back down to the car and the bathroom again. I meet him halfway before I get to the intersection. He is sweaty and disheveled with a weird look in his eyes. I say, where have you been? He says that he went to the bathroom, and when he got back to the intersection, we weren't there. I say, what do you mean? We were waiting here this entire time, for over an hour. We checked the car, the bathroom, the trailhead, and you weren't here. He says, well, I don't know. I went to the bathroom. He then asks me where my uncle is. I say at the trailhead. He asks me again. And I tell him again, and note that it was weird that he asked me twice. As we're crossing the bridge to the trailhead, he sees a light off on the riverbank and exclaims, Maybe that's him. And I just look at him and keep walking. I thought his behavior was very strange, like he wasn't thinking straight, like he wasn't all there. 
We finally get on with the hike, and it goes by as normal, except that we seem to keep on losing things, such as my uncle's small red flashlight and one of the girl's gloves, a water bottle, etc. It's like we just simply forgot about the items and couldn't remember where we left them. On the way back, it got pretty dark, and we turned on our flashlights, and as we neared the end of the hike, after the last two waterfalls, it begins to seem as if we were walking for far too long. It feels like we had been walking in circles almost. My uncle also confirms this, asking me, doesn't it seem like it's taking way longer to get back? I say yeah, I was just thinking that. We keep walking, but it still seems like we aren't making any real progress. I've been on that trail many times, and as I was walking, I could not spot any familiar landmarks. It was weird. There was this feeling. It was odd. You could feel it in the air. Sort of like a slight menacing feeling. It's hard to describe. I remember thinking, it feels like the woods are alive. We remarked three more times about how long the hike is taking and begin to laugh at it because it felt so ridiculous. After a bit longer, we finally and suddenly find ourselves on the final stretch and make it back to the car. Now, all of this seemed very odd at the time, but I just brushed it off. I only realized how weird these events were after the fact. I honestly don't know what to make of all of this. My uncle kind of looks at everything different now. And honestly, I look at things different too. But I wanted to share this and see if there were any opinions in the swamp. I was at Yosemite National Park last spring break. I was with my friend Christine, her family, and two other families that had kids around our age, between 15 and 17. The parents were super boring and didn't have many activities planned, so we decided to find big rocks to climb. We did this because two of the boys, who were brothers, were obsessed with rock climbing. They had the gear for free climbing, but they were not good at all. We start off by following a trail and off to the right are a bunch of rocks piled up. We walk over there, I forgot to mention that there are about seven of us, and we start climbing all over the rocks. It was a little damp, so everyone but the two brothers were very cautious. After about 20 minutes of going from rock to rock, we came across this mountain. I don't know which one it was. It was not El Capitan or Half Dome, but it was rather big. I will try to post pictures of it if I can find it somewhere. Anyway, we see this ledge kind of thing that was easy to climb, so four of us go up about 20 feet and come back down. It is hard to explain, but hopefully... You can Google it and find it someday. So the wall seems to go on forever. So we start walking along the wall and there was this little hill we had to go over. We did, and I remember at one point I turned around and I could see Half Dome. It was so beautiful. I could see the tree line and it was amazing. Two days go by, and every day for about two hours, we would go up to the same route and get to the wall. It was our hangout zone for the week, and we really enjoyed it. There were no parents, no trails, no people but us, and a few squirrels here and there. It is about 6.30, and it is time for dinner. My friend's parents are South African, so they were making a South African stew. As we start to descend from the ledge, we hear somebody calling my friend Christine's name. We assume her dad had found us, since we told her parents about the wall. We reply, We're coming! Now we head in the direction of the voice, but there was nobody there. So we assumed that her father went back to the campsite after we replied. We get back to the campsite and all the parents are sitting around. We don't mention the name calling because we honestly thought it was her dad. The next day we go up there, we are at the rocks that you must get over to get to the wall. The oldest brother, Jared, says, Guys, keep looking forward. Christine said, What, do you see a bear? Jared then looked at her and said, how far away are we from the trail? Christine responds, I don't know, maybe a hundred yards. Now, any logical hiker knows that you do not go off trail for safety reasons. We should have stayed on the trail since the beginning, but we are stupid. Jared then tells everyone to stop and to get close. I start looking around at about 50 feet away. I see a man who was skinny, had a beard, dreadlocks, and a flannel on. He was holding a flashlight. 
he was just staring at us. We all freaked out and climbed down as fast as we could. And about halfway down we hear, Christine. That's when we basically flew off the rocks and hauled our butts back to the campsite. We told our parents and the next day we switched campsites. We told the park rangers and had descriptions of the man, but everyone in the local vicinity of the campground did not meet the description. About five years ago, my wife and I went on a weekend camping trip with our two closest friends, who are also another married couple. The campsite is just outside of Yosemite and is absolutely beautiful. The beauty of it, and creepiness of it, is that you take a dirt road for about an hour and a half off the main road to get to it. It is extremely secluded, but never felt threatening. It's a popular campsite, so there were always people around, especially in the summer months when this occurred. The first day was awesome. I don't remember exactly what we did, but I remember having a great time. The campsites are all close together and usually separated by various shrubs. I remember we were all pumped about the site we got, as there were no neighbors on one side, just forest, and no one occupying the site next to us. This is pretty uncommon, as these campgrounds stay fully booked throughout the summer. Day two started normally. We had breakfast, then headed to the lake for a couple of hours. The lake was about a 20 minute hike from the main campground. When we got back at around two-ish, we noticed that the site next to us now had a silver rental car parked on it. We didn't think too much of it and went about our way making our fire to start our cooking. At some point we noticed the occupant of the site next to us, an average looking white guy, maybe in his early 40s. Honestly, he was so average looking that it was hard to even picture him. We all immediately caught on to the fact that he was constantly looking over at us. My friend Dave made a comment to me under his breath. You notice this guy keeps looking over here, right? I remember feeling a little uncomfortable, as we were still in bathing suits from the lake, but I made a conscious effort to ignore it. It's worth mentioning that we were a little buzzed and drunk. Not out of control or anything, just feeling pretty good. Throughout the afternoon and into the evening, we continued to notice the guy constantly looking over at us. In hindsight, Dave or I should have called out to him. The story doesn't really make us look great, but whatever. I had been stressed at work prior to the trip, and really didn't want to let some creepy dude throw off my relaxed vibe. This is stupid, I know. The alcohol, coupled with the fact that we honestly kind of felt bad for him, led us to not confront him. Yes, it was very creepy, but I told myself he was just an awkward lonely guy, and tried to think nothing of it. Aside from the staring, there were a couple of other weird incidents that occurred leading up to the very weird stuff. The first was that at some point, he left his sight to go do whatever. While he was gone, a girl, probably in her mid-twenties around our age, walked by and snapped a picture of his license plate. I remember asking her if she needed anything, and she smiled awkwardly and kept walking. Dave and I both thought this was odd, but we were preoccupied with beer. Later into the evening, around 7-ish, the camp host was doing her rounds checking people in. She checked us in and moved on to him. I remember us all eavesdropping intently to hear what they were saying. I think we just wanted to hear what this creep sounded like. He kept asking questions about the bathhouse. We didn't know that there was a bathhouse, or even what a bathhouse was, but he had a hundred different questions about it. Where is it? How late is it open? Is it private? Maybe not that weird, but in context, odd. The sun started to go down. We were all drunk, so we weren't too concerned with Creepy Dude anymore. At one point, we all went for a walk and noticed him snooping around on what we believed to be the bathhouse. Now, I would kind of call out this behavior in hindsight, but again, I was drunk and five years stupider at this time. We all laughed and talked about how creepy he was. Back at the site, we continued to drink and have a good time. At one point, the guy started eating beans aggressively out of a can in the light of a single lantern, with no fire. He looked at us while doing it the entire time, and Dave and I kind of snickered to each other at how weird it was. I don't think the girls noticed. Eventually, we decided to go to bed. I think the guy had left his sight again at this point. I kind of remember us making jokes, I better not wake up to that dude looking in our window. 
My wife and I slept in our SUV with the seats folded down. Dave and Sarah slept in the camper shell of their truck. I remember feeling a little creeped out as I fell asleep but shrugged it off. At around 2.30 a.m., both my wife and I were jolted awake by what sounded like a woman's scream. We both looked at each other and asked if we both heard that. We concluded that it was probably some other people being loud and we decided to go back to sleep. As I was trying to go back to sleep, I started to feel very unsettled. I decided to get out of the car and look around. I cracked my door, trying to be as quiet as possible. I had gotten about one leg out of the car when I heard a faint but direct whispering coming from Dave and Sarah's camper shell about four feet away. I froze and then heard it again. I eventually realized that they were trying to tell me something. I whispered back, What? And I heard Dave clearly say, Start your car. I instantly realized that something was wrong, so rather than ask questions, I climbed back in to start my car. Right away, Dave and Sarah burst out of the back of the camper and frantically jumped into my car. They told me to drive. They were too freaked out to explain, so I drove kind of aimlessly. Eventually, I pulled over, figuring that we were far enough from whatever had freaked them out. Finally, Sarah calmed down enough to tell us what had happened. As she put it, she was woken by a light coming from the creepy dude's campsite. Apparently, he had set up lanterns and flashlights to spotlight himself completely naked, masturbating in the direction of our cars. She also mentioned that he was flaccid and not able to finish. A gross detail, but I feel it's important for you all to know because if I have to suffer with it, so do you guys. It gets weirder. At some point, he stopped and turned off the lights and began using a flashlight to signal across a small ravine that campsites backed up to. I'm talking like Morse code stuff. Across the ravine, an old RV began using its headlights to signal back. Dave was awake by this point. I questioned them on this detail and they both said it was very clear that they were communicating. After that, he turned off his light. Keep in mind, it is absolutely pitch black out there at night. After a few minutes, they heard footsteps around their car, followed by a hard tap on the window. That is when Sarah started screaming, hence waking me up. At this point, I decided that we needed to call the police. The problem was there was absolutely zero cell service at the campsite. Furthermore, it was about an hour and a half to get to any sort of civilization. Plus, leaving at night wasn't really an option. We decided the best course of action was to stay alert and keep the camp host up to date with what was happening. We drove around and eventually found the trailer she lived in. She was understandably confused to be woken up at 3.30 in the morning, but was responsive. She mentioned that the guy was weird when she checked him in and called the police on her satellite phone. Apparently, there was a massive wildlife fire burning that weekend, and the police said they wouldn't be able to send anyone out until sunrise. The camp host said there really wasn't anything else she could do beyond calling the police. It really sucked hearing that. Basically, we were stuck in our car in the pitch blackness, while some crazy masturbating dude was out and about, not to mention whoever was in that RV. One more weird thing happened, though. At around 4 a.m., we were all still sitting in my car when a man in a hood walked right up to the window. The second I noticed him, I turned on my engine and headlights. He ran off into the trees. We all sat in my car until sunrise. Once it was light out, we went back to the site to pack up our things. His car was still there, with blankets hung in all the windows. The whole thing just felt gross. We wanted to get the hell out of there, so we quickly packed up and left. A couple of hours after we left, I got a call from the police. They said they went out to the campsite and questioned the guy. He was simply showering. The cop told me there was nothing he could do. It was our word against his. He also questioned the people in the RV. They said they didn't know what he was talking about, but mentioned, and I quote, a very rude camper screamed in the middle of the night. The whole experience with the police was frustrating. I tried following up. I even tried getting help from my family members, who's a sheriff, but even he said there wasn't really anything they could do unless the police chief really wanted to investigate this guy. So... That's my story. I learned a lesson about being polite when someone is making you feel uncomfortable. Nowadays, I'm much more aggressive with creepy people. I also know it's easy to hear this story and wonder why Dave or myself didn't just confront the guy, especially when he's literally masturbating at your car. But I don't know.
I loved camping. I used to spend every waking moment either camping or planning a camping trip. I loved being outdoors away from the suffocating mundanity of everyday events, the first world problems, so to speak. I used to do it hardcore too, making shelters instead of taking a tent, drinking from mountain streams, hunting, and setting traps for our food. So in April of last year, two friends and I departed on a four-night hiking and camping trip on the Appalachian Trail. With loads more than 50 pounds, we marched 20 miles into the lush, green hills before reaching our first major water source, a long strip of tranquil, clear water set in a picturesque valley. The journey took us about two days, with around 18 hours of straight marching, our packs digging agonizingly into our shoulders with every step. Yet the sense of achievements was intoxicating. Days and night rolled by as we worked on our way along the trail, foraging food as we went. It was tiring, a constant struggle, but the sense of peace that the outdoors can provide is profound. At night we skewered hot dogs on sticks, wolfing them down as we warmed sweet apple cider in our mess tins over the fire. We listened to owls call out like ghosts and watched embers dance up into the air like fireflies as our eyelids grew heavy. We found a fair amount of fruit and fresh water. It was plentiful, but our attempts at finding protein came short to each turn. We were unable to find any duck eggs, too slow or too inexperienced to snare rabbits, and our improvised fishing rods weren't working as well as we were used to. We were getting desperate, and although we were trying, man cannot live on cereal bars and peanut butter alone. We would have to take a journey to the nearest town, nearly seven miles away. This is where things get bad, because we got lost. After a few hours of walking, we began to climb a steep hill by means of a shortcut. The whole way up, I remember watching a thick fog cling to the top of the hill, at least 500 meters above us. Only it wasn't exactly clinging. It was just waiting, waiting for the temperature to drop low enough for it to roll down onto us, over us, and it did. I remember the image of my friend Chris being severely obscured as I walked behind him. We tried to remain cheerful. Then we came upon what seemed to be the remains of a newborn lamb. April is a birthing month for sheep, so this isn't necessarily an unusual sight. But these remained completely unscathed. No scavengers had touched these corpses, and there were quite a few of them. We were relieved when the outline of a cottage came into view. We had absolutely no idea where we were, and there was no mention of any cottage on our map. My feet ached and our water supplies dwindled. Having not expected to be out or lost for such a long time, we decided to stop and ask for directions. We had to climb over a low dry stone wall to reach the building itself. As the cottage was oddly set into the hillside, I noted with grim interest that there was no path leading to or from any kind of road or highway the dwelling being completely cut off from all human contact. We stopped as we reached the front gate, or what passed off as a front gate. It was made of a few roughly cut tree limbs, crudely bound together with rusted nails and rotting twine. Chris tried to open it, but there was no hinge. It just fell back onto his hands. He set it aside politely, albeit confusedly. The small courtyard before the front door was overgrown with weeds, grass growing long between the broken slabs of concrete beneath our feet. Dotted around a smaller front garden was an assortment of curios placed in decorative positions. Things were tied to the branches of a sapling in the center of the haggard lawn. Small toy cars, tennis balls, a hairbrush. A wheelbarrow sat at the front of it, filthy from exposure, containing a few soggy-looking books, some VHS cassettes, and a children's action figure. They were oddly arranged in a rough circle around the action figure. Arriving nervously at the door, I reached my arm out, feeling it grow heavy as I made a fist. I rapped three times, making it shake under the force, then waited, listening for signs of life, peering through a small, filthy window to the right of the decrepit door. I could make out yet more assorted, seemingly non-related items scattered on the shelves and tables. That's when I turned to Chris. I remember simply remarking that we should move on, and that there was nobody home. But he didn't respond. There was something about him. He looked pale and confused. I can hardly explain it now, 
that I tried to recall it. He'd been looking through the grubby windows as I had been knocking on the door and had gotten a much better look inside the house. It was almost like he had seen something but just could not explain what it was. He began shaking his head violently, hyperventilating, as he rushed out of the little courtyard. I was completely confused, a little frightened, and began shouting after him, asking him why the hell he was acting so strange. Yeah, the little cottage was weird as hell, but he was acting like he had just seen a ghost or something. He only replied to me once through gritted teeth. We need to leave now. Later that night, while we were nursing beers around our campfire, I finally plucked up the courage to ask him what he had seen through the window. He started shaking his head in that same weird way, stuttering as he tried to find the words to articulate himself. He went on to explain that someone had been in that cottage the whole time hiding from us. That as I had been banging away, trying to get their attention, that they had taken one solitary look outside at us, right into my buddy's eyes. My buddy said he had never seen anyone so messed up, that he couldn't tell if they were disabled or if they had just been beaten so badly that their face had been rearranged. He said that when they'd locked eyes, the figure on the other side of the glass looked honestly terrified. But there's no way that they could have been surviving alone up there. Something else was living there too. Something that might have been heading back to us, to arrive at any moment. I thank God we didn't find out what it was. Hi everyone, my name is Lena. I'm Malaysian, and I spent a summer in the United States as a part of a school program at Virginia Tech University. There are lots of extracurricular activities to do. I mean, what else were we going to do with our spare time? So I got to know a lot of my classmates rather well while doing all sorts of cool things. One of the most amazing things I got to do while there was a hiking trip in the Appalachian Mountains in the Appalachian Trail. I managed to get some pictures of the most stunning views I have ever seen in my life, and walking those hills will remain one of my most memorable moments. But I'll never forget this interesting encounter I had in the Appalachians, for one reason, because it included one of the most hair-raising, terrifying experiences of my life, one of which left me shaking for the amount of adrenaline running through me. So, at one point, we were taking a break from hiking, eating some snacks, and taking sips from our bottles of water that didn't manage to stay very cold for long. I'm chatting with my best friends on the trip, Sol and Gabby, when we hear some rustling in the foliage next to us. The next thing I hear is our guide whispering, Don't move. No one move a muscle. This was strange to me because they had been confident to the point of cockiness all the way up until now. A real outdoorsy manly man type but hearing the fear in their voice made my blood turn to ice, which has no small feet on such a hot day. I did what I was told. I did not move. I just sort of shifted my eyes in the direction of the rustling, and when I saw what came out of the bushes, I could not even scream, as I was so scared. It was like I had been turned into a stone statue, albeit one that trembled uncontrollably with fear. It was a bear. A black bear and it was walking right towards me. I suppose it had been attracted to the smell of our snacks. From what I understand, black bears don't have the best eyesight, but they do have an incredible sense of smell, and even though we weren't cooking any food, it must have been close enough in the area to pick up the scent. I stayed as still as I possibly could as it walked up to me, but when it stood up on its hind legs, I swear my heart nearly stopped beating altogether. I had no idea they could do that. Like, I knew of black bears and, you know, grizzly bears and polar bears and stuff like that, but I never thought that they did this behavior. But oh my god, this thing was not small when it stood up like that. It was easily six feet tall. I was trembling and holding back whimpers of fear as it started to sniff at my hijab, knowing that if I made one wrong move, if I didn't keep my cool and stay perfectly still, it might just maul me to death right then and there. It was probably the most terrifying moment of my life so far. It seemed to have lost interest in me after a few moments, moving on to my friend Saul, who just dropped the sandwich he was eating immediately. The bear sniffed at it, but ignored it, and then did the same thing to her, standing on its hind legs and sniffing at her face and neck. Then suddenly, just out of nowhere, 
it just lost interest in us and wandered off into the woods again. We all breathed a heavy sigh of relief, thanking God that it wasn't hungry or ballsy enough to have attacked us. Never in all my years have I ever been in such an up-close encounter with such a powerful wild beast. It left an incredible mark on me, giving me a profound respect for nature, even more than I had beforehand. I just thank God it wasn't a grizzly or something that was a little bit more aggressive, because if it was, I more than likely wouldn't be here to tell this story. I used to lead an outdoor club, and one of the trips I would always take people on was to the Smoky Mountains in mid-October. The Smokies are beautiful, and we would do a four-night backpacking loop using the backcountry three-walled shelters along the Appalachian Trail. The weather was perfect. Fall colors, cool nights, and the classic fog that gives the Smokies their name. It was our last night on the trail, and we were staying on top of Mount Lacante, one of the tallest mountains in the Smokies. I had reserved all the spots in the shelter, about 12, and there were no other campsites on top of the mountain, so I knew we would be alone. Here's some background. Bear with me. The top of Mount Lacante has a western lookout point, an eastern lookout point, and a half-mile trail called the Boulevard that connects the overlooks and runs the ridgeline of the mountain. The trails are covered by scraggly evergreens that cling to the top of the mountain, and there are thousand-foot drops alongside the trailing edge. The shelter is about midway on the trail. All my friends and I decided that we would sleep under the stars. So we went to the next shelter. The Milky Way was incredible from there. Sometime around 5 a.m., we were all going to walk to our sleeping bags to the eastern lookout point to see the sunrise. But we stayed up late, and my friend and I decided that he and I would just go to the eastern lookout at 3 a.m. and chat until the sun began to rise. It was a chilly night and the fog had begun to roll in. It pushed through the dense evergreens and limited the visibility to the bright white cones from our headlamps. My friend and I grabbed our bear spray and sleeping bags and started walking eastward on the boulevard. Once we started moving, I realized how bad the visibility actually was. The trail snaked through the foggy trees and you could never see what was around the next bend. There were reports of bears in the area, so I kept my bear spray out and made as much noise as I could. The fog rolled through the trees like a haunted house. It's something that I'd never forget. As I turned a bend, I nearly ran into a man. He's standing alone in the middle of the trail facing me, not wearing a t-shirt and only has a small book bag. Keep in mind, it's about freezing outside. With bear spray leveled, I stammer, Hello? No response. I ask him where he is coming from and where he is going. I don't know. His facial expressions look lifeless. I ask him where he's planning on sleeping tonight. Given that he has no gear, he replies, I don't know, with you? Hell no. I could put it together pretty quick. This guy was definitely on a lot of drugs. He eventually admitted that he had walked from a town that is about 30 miles away, but he kept on saying he wanted to stay with us at the shelter. Then he would speak nonsense. Suddenly he said, I'm being followed by a dog. I figured he was just seeing things, so I asked what it looks like. It's big and black, and it has an orange collar. I realize it's probably one of the tagged bears in the park. This sketchy guy is being stalked by a bear and leading it towards my friends who are sleeping in a shelter. I tell him I know of a spot he can stay, a luxury cabin around 15 minutes down the mountain where they can call the NPS. I tell him to walk in front of me, and I start directing him around where to turn. I figured if he tried something erratic, I could blind him with my light and follow up with the bear spray. I eventually get him down to his cabin, wake up the employees to let them know what he needs. They tell me I can leave, so I head back to my friends and tell them what's going on. Before I get to sleep, I jog back down to the rangers to make sure everything is fine, and it seemingly was. My boyfriend and I are a young couple in their mid-college years. We decided that we wanted to get away from the work and our studies for the weekend, so we took a trip to the nearest hiking trail that is a part of the Appalachian Trail. 
We decided to leave on a Friday once I got off work and backpack up the trail to camp and stay there over the weekend. I work in a restaurant, and it's very difficult to have some time set aside to be able to leave work. I ended up leaving work around 4 p.m., but we said that no matter what, we would be going on this trip. We finally left for the trail, and we began hiking at around 5.30. My boyfriend was an Eagle Scout, so we had all the necessary supplies for a successful camping trip, and of course, necessary substances to free our minds after the long hike. The first part of the hike was absolutely exhausting. It was all uphill, and we were both carrying at least 40 pounds in our metal-framed backpacks. An hour later, we finally passed the first shelter. If not many of you know, a shelter on this trail is about a 10 foot by 15 foot log cabin that only has three walls, as it is open to the outside. It's specifically used as a shelter to sleep in or hide from the rain. Midway through the hike, it began to pour dramatically in the forest. Sooner or later, we were both soaked from head to toe. The thick fog grew quickly, as it had been hot and a humid day. The trail became very slippery, and our pace slowed down tremendously. We had hoped that we were making good time to the camping site, but it turned very dark very quickly. We took a rest in the dark as it poured on us in hopes that we would be able to find our headlamps. Once we found our headlamps, we placed them on our heads, still struggling to balance ourselves on top of the rocky and muddy path. I thought by that point, we would never make it to the shelter. We walked, never giving up, although I wanted to, as my socks and shoes were wet. I was tired, hungry, drenched, and cold. The temperature had also dropped more than 25 degrees as we made our way up. It was somewhere around 8.30 when we finally made it through to the second shelter and campgrounds. There was a split in the path. Either you could walk straight to continue to the top of the view, which was about a mile and a half away, or you could turn slightly and make a right on the path and continue up to the campgrounds. Or you could also take a 90 degree turn and walk right down to the shelter. At that point, we were drenched from head to toe and needed to dry off. It was still raining pretty bad, so it would have been nearly impossible to set up our camp and tent. We had decided that we would stay put in the shelter until the rain calmed down. We didn't hear anyone at the shelter, so I was extremely excited to have the place to ourselves and take a few tokes if you know what I mean. After our hike, I was dead set on it. Once we walked to the shelter and got to the opening, there was a man and a woman in their 60s. We instantly thought to ourselves that they were an older couple who wanted to get away for the weekend too. We told them that we wouldn't be bothering them for long, so we put our backpacks down and attempted to dry off. The couple were very welcoming. With a lantern and an absorbing towel for me to dry off with, my boyfriend and I took our shirts off since they were both carrying a lot of weight and water. The couple seemed very normal, and the man brought a cute dog with him that I enjoyed playing with. We began introducing ourselves with our names and where we were from, and what we were doing out here. They both said they were in their 60s, their names were Joe and Maya, and they were just messing around for the weekend. In between sentences, they were taking large gulps of what looked like to be alcohol in their water pack. They said they were just having fun and met online, which veered off into dropping hints that they were there having an affair. The older woman, who says that she comes from West Virginia, struck me to be very weird. It began with her looks at first, having scraggly, shorter-length gray hair with circular glasses resting on her face. Her teeth were very dark, nearly covered in a brown film, as if she had been using hard drugs. She wore a pullover, hiking boots, and jean shorts that nearly exposed everything. Joe, on the other hand, was just an average white male who had gray hair and was just a tad bit overweight. They spoke about their past employments and what they had done in life. Maya said that she was a writer, who I did admire. We continued to exchange information and small talk, since they seemed very friendly. I was in a very bad mood though, and very irritable until I smoked some. My boyfriend and I periodically showed each other our phones to communicate, as we didn't have any service, but we didn't want to say things out loud. We agreed that it was okay to start smoking since they were becoming drunk. They said they didn't mind but would like to join. I thought it was absolutely insane that they wanted to smoke at that age. The man only took two hits but the woman took many and she was struggling a lot to even flick the lighter. The guys began their own conversation and the woman and I veered off on our own as well. The woman 
began to ask me strange questions and then told me some sort of story. As she inched closer and closer to me, she would ask me to tell her a story. She grew more and more demanding, saying, Tell me a story. My boyfriend and I met online, just as they did, so I was going to tell her about the story of how we met. I began the story with, So you met online, right? The woman nearly cuts me off and angrily says, What? Why would you say that? I said to her, You all met online, right? She nearly cuts me off again and then aggressively says, What? Why would you say that? I said again, Earlier Joe said you all met online, didn't you? She nearly shouts and growls. Why do you say that? I wanted to jump away from the conversation quickly, so I asked her, Well, you're a writer, you said, right? So why don't you tell me about one of your best stories? The woman suddenly becomes very happy and giggly, and while swirling her hands around her head in the air, she said, Well, I'm a writer, in my mind. I was extremely confused and creeped out at this point. I honestly just didn't know what to say. I'm the type of person to laugh it off, so that's what I tried to do. She just said she's enjoyed being a writer in her mind. I look over at my boyfriend and Joe's conversation and it seemed to be as normal as can be. There was absolutely nothing wrong with it from what I could tell, but Maya nearly gave me the chills as she got my attention, getting closer into my face, asking me what I was saying. The problem was as I wasn't saying anything. I was silent, ignoring her. She began talking to herself. She would make very in-depth hand gestures as she spoke to herself, then would ask me what I was saying to her. I just wasn't saying a word, and she would wonder what I was telling her. She would abruptly say, yes, no, maybe, or no way, yeah, it can't wait, wait, huh? It was very weird. As she started to rock back and forth, waving her arms around, she began crossing her legs, holding her arms up in the air above her head. She started to shout, coming out, I'm coming out, I'm coming out. She was nearly talking gibberish. None of this made any sense and was creeping me out. The older man's attention was caught and he asked her what in the world she was doing. She says I'm calling out, it's witchcraft. I was nearly high and terrified of all my surroundings. It stormed loudly in the background and was pitch black all around us. A small lamp rested on a beam above our heads in the middle of the wooden shelter. It was very wet and very vulnerable. Everything slowly began to get worse that night. Maya kept slurring her words, and the man demanded she gets in her sleeping bag and sleep. I sat against the wall next to my boyfriend very closely as the man crawled into his sleeping bag, and Maya attempted to put her legs in the sleeping bag but couldn't figure out how it worked apparently. She moved around for a very long time, and finally ended up curling up next to Joe on top of her sleeping bag. She was probably freezing as it was 35 degrees by 9.30. Only a few minutes passed and we heard Maya whisper. Maya said angrily, what did you give me? She growls again. What did you give me? The man finally woke up and demanded, What? Maya hits him on his back and yells, What did you give me? She jumped up immediately facing us. Her eyes were nearly all black as her pupils were so enlarged. She looked nearly sadistic and yelled at us, What did he give me? My boyfriend and I tensed up, nearly losing our minds. She screams, the same thing over and over, even louder. As her voice screeched into my eardrums, she once again turned around to the man Laying down behind him, she slowly whispered into his ear, Did you give me acid? It began to run through my mind that he had drugged her, or she was having a flashback of a bad trip. Joe attempted to calm her down, but she was still restless. She laid down for approximately five minutes, but Maya immediately sat up. She faced us with her legs crossed. She stared at us without breaking eye contact for at least five minutes. She did this every so often, sitting up staring at us, then laying back down. She would do this repeatedly, so we decided to leave. We finally found our way out as she stared at us for one last time. We pitched a camp as far away as possible, but I remained sleepless that night and fear Maya would find our tent and crawl into it. So I never have connected the strange personal experience I had with any of this phenomenon that I've been reading about the missing 411 recently. But I realized I did have a very strange experience in a park that although isn't quite as dramatic as some of the other accounts, is still nonetheless quite strange. I really don't have a good explanation for it. And honestly, my mind has never really been able to make sense of it. Like I said, it's certainly not as dramatic as many of the stories on this show. There can easily be some rational explanations, I'm sure and I know people will throw them out. Honestly, I'm not sure what it was, and I have zero conclusions in my mind, if it was even anything at all. 
I'm the kind of person who rationalizes all their personal experiences of the weird in my mind. So, I experienced what I believe was a time slip. I've been reluctant to share this on the show in fear that it would make my other contributions doubted. So I experienced what I believe was a time slip. I've been reluctant to share this story on the show because I don't want people to think that I'm crazy and doubt my other information that I put out there. It's a thing I haven't talked about much with many people. I have talked about it with the other people who experienced similar things and a few people who I've been close with, but it's just not something I've talked much about. And honestly, after talking about it at length with a few people who were there right after it happened, I felt like I would never bring it up again. So please forgive any errors and it being a bit foggy as it's been a long time since this occurred. So, this happened around the mid-90s in Florida in the Blackwater River State Park. It's only a state park and not a national one. Blackwater is a very extensive and very popular trail that connects to other trails. Although not officially a part of the Appalachian Trail, there are trails that join up to that trail and go all the way to the Appalachian. It's a very popular destination for hiking, especially up and down the East Coast, that's for sure. I and a bunch of my friends decided to go out to Carrick for a three-day weekend. This isn't really all that unusual, as we frequently camped at Carrick and other sites. We packed up and headed out Friday. Nothing unusual for us. We were all between the ages of 16 and 22 years old. Most of us were still in high school except for my friend's boyfriend who was 22. He was also the most experienced camper and a former Eagle Scout. We set up a designated primitive site a good way away from most of the other sites on the trailhead. We didn't realize how well traveled that trail was and it had quite a bit of foot traffic. If we had known, we probably wouldn't have picked that site. The whole park was disappointingly packed with campers and hikers. In fact, all the parking lots were full. I guess the weather probably brought people out. Now, none of us were planning any extensive hikes as the goal of the weekend wasn't extensive hiking per se and was more about camping. But of course, Blackwater is known for hiking trails, so we figured we would be going on and off short hikes you know, of course everybody wants to try to enjoy the scenery a bit, right? It was fall and the weather was gorgeous. We had purposely waited for the weather to cool and turn. Only masochists would go camping in the dead humidity and heat of summer. Not to mention the bugs we also chose that weekend because of those of us in high school. Most of us had Monday off. Nothing of note really happened, and we were all having a pretty good time. We went for some group hikes and some solitary hikes off the loop. Nothing noteworthy. So anyway... Long story short, I get up very early Sunday before the sun rises and decided that I'm going to do a short solo hike. I tell my tentmate what trail I'm going on and when I should be back. No big deal. I had a decent sized breakfast and I grab some water and head out. So I head out on this trail. It's just about sunrise and I'm having a great time. The trail is clearly marked with blazes and signs with miles at regularly intervaled parts. It is a very well maintained heavily traveled trail. I decided I'm going to hike to the nearest landmark about a mile and a half away. At the time, I was an experienced hiker and in excellent physical shape, as I was an athlete on more than one sports team. I could hike at a pace far quicker than most, but I allotted for two hours. It seemed reasonable enough to do a full three-mile circle, so I hiked to the place and stayed for about ten minutes, if that because it was disappointingly scenic. In fact, I was kind of irritated because I knew there were much prettier and more scenic hikes I could have taken for the same amount of time. I felt like it was such a waste for the last day of the trip, but I headed back and nothing seemed to be happening. No bad feelings, nothing unusual. The only thing that was odd is that I encountered not a single hiker on the trail, but I just chalked it up to being an early Sunday. Anyways, I get back to the campsite and everyone is obviously very upset. I asked why and apparently everyone was freaked out because of me. I apparently had not returned when I was supposed to, and they had even supposedly gone down the trail looking for me. When they couldn't find me, they had said that they had decided to wait for camp just for a little longer to see if I would come back. When I didn't come back in an hour or so, they were freaking out and about to report me to the park ranger. I found out it was early afternoon. Everyone was super angry at me because I hadn't stuck to the plan. I told my tentmate that I would be back by a certain time, and I never was. No one ever believed my story that I hiked to the place I said and came right back. Everyone for years was still convinced I was playing a joke on everyone and hiding or trying to be funny. 
It's entirely possible I could have spent more time on the trail than I thought. Maybe just got mixed up or something. But what I still can't get out of my mind is two things. How could I have possibly spent that much time hiking three miles? I didn't linger or stop anywhere. And I 100% stayed on the same exact trail. It was really disappointing trail, so there really wasn't anything to look at that would have made me slow down or get off of it. The trails were very well maintained with blazes and signs. There is no way you could really step off the trail and not know it. And I was an athlete, so in my prime physical shape. The other thing that's bizarre to me, still to this day, I've never been able to put the pieces together. If people were searching for me on the trail, how did they not pass me? Honestly, I cannot resolve this in my mind. And I don't think anyone else ever accepted my version of events. My name is Eric. This is a short story about my grandfather's cabin in the Sierras, on the California side of Lake Tahoe. One summer, when I was 16 years old, I randomly decided to take a trip with my aunt and uncle to my grandpa's cabin to see my other aunt and stay the night. One summer, when I was 16 years old, I randomly decided to take a trip with my aunt and uncle to my grandpa's cabin to see my other aunt and stay the night. It was a decent trip from my grandpa's house in Reno to the cabin, and we left in the afternoon so when we got there, we were really tired. We all stayed up and talked for about three hours before we decided to go to sleep. There were only two bedrooms, so I was going to sleep on the couch in the living room. The living room is incredibly open and has a high ceiling. Both bedrooms were on the south side of the cabin. One was upstairs and one was downstairs. My aunt and uncle were upstairs together and about one minute later, my other aunt went into her room downstairs. After they turned the lights out, I lay down on my back in the dark for three to five minutes. When I heard a little girl ask me, What are you doing here? clear as anything, in a truly kind, mature, and earnest manner. The voice seemed to be coming from above me, maybe 10 or 15 feet straight above my head. The only way to explain it is that it sounded out of body. I calmly and instinctively answered and asked her, what are you doing here? There was no response, and after about 30 seconds of silence, I suddenly got frightened of what just transpired. I did manage to fall asleep within an hour and nothing else really happened to me that night. But the next morning, when I told my aunt that lived there what happened, she casually replied, If you don't bother them, they won't bother you, and proceeded to show me her mineral and crystal collection, as well as books describing the properties and effects of each one she had and many more. I could not help but be suspicious that my aunt had brought something into that cabin somehow accidentally. Fast forward about ten years, my cousin related a story to my sister about the cabin. Apparently, he almost sleepwalked himself right out of the top story window in the middle of the night. His friend stopped him before he made it all the way out and woke him up. When my sister told me this, I spoke to my cousin and he confirmed the story. Also, he told me he had never sleepwalked before or after that night in my grandfather's cabin. I have always been a suspicious person, and I am familiar with the art of deception. I doubt that that little girl I heard was simply a harmless ghost. I think it was a disguise. I believe that only powerful cryptids and demons can manipulate people or cause physical harm. A powerful ghost, perhaps, but not likely. I have warned my family members about the dangers of the cabin. I feel like I am the only person suited to visit and possibly manage whatever is there. This story takes place on a lake in central New Hampshire, just a few miles north of the base of Mount Kersarge. My friend has a cabin there, and his grandfather built it shortly after returning from the Second World War, and one warm summer night between my junior and senior years of high school, he and I were there, just hanging out. While we did drink and partake in the ganja from time to time, we were not intoxicated in any way on this night. We had simply been bored in our little hometown about 30 miles or approximately 48 kilometers to the south. So on a whim one evening, we decided to drive up and spend the night there to light a fire and sit by the water on the beach chairs and enjoy the nighttime t-shirt and swimming trunks weather while it lasted. I would say it was around 9 or 10 p.m. 
and we had gotten up to inspect his grandfather's old canoe that laid upside down atop the wooden dock because we wanted to use it the next day to head to the Lone Island to look for loon nests and try to catch some catfish. As we walked to the dock from where we had been sitting, I gazed across the lake at Mount Kirsarge. The mountain has a height of 2,937 feet, or 895 meters, and a prominence of 2,080 feet, or 630 meters. So, since it was basically 2,000 feet straight up from our position, as we were only a couple of miles from its summit, it was quite an imposing figure in the night sky. Now the mountain has a tower on the peak that flashes a red light at night. There is only one light and it is red. I had seen it many times before. It was just a fact, however, as I followed my friend to the dock that I noticed there were more than two lights on this night. In addition to the usual red flashing light, there was a second, yellowish-orange orb to its right, essentially equidistant in height. It was not moving, flashing, pulsating, nothing. It just hung there, motionless in the night sky. I told my friend who was immediately interested, and so we were both just stood there, transfixed for a while before he asked me what the hell I thought it was. I would have immediately considered a helicopter, but it was just so still and silent. After just a few moments of silent staring, we both shrugged our shoulders and continued down to the canoe at the end of the dock. We inspected it for a while, placing it in the lake to check for leaks and decided that it was good to go, which was exciting, as we were really looking forward to getting on the water. After lugging it back to the original resting position, I turned to my right and bent down to wash the cobwebs off my fingers in the lake. As I was doing this, I returned my gaze to the mountain, and to my amazement, there were now two identical orbs, one on either side of the red flashing light. I smacked my friend across the shoulder and told him to look up, and again, we just stared transfixed, albeit this time a little more anxiety-ridden. What the hell? My friend said, with a bit of fear creeping into his voice. Without averting our gaze, we backpedaled to our chairs and began discussing possibilities. It is important to note that both of us were science-believing realists, and still are to this day. We both accepted the distinct possibility that we, humanity, were most likely not alone in this never-ending galaxy, let alone the universe. Something. All the grains of sand on Earth. You know, the old Carl Sagan adage. So, as we sat, discussing both the Fermi paradox and the likelihood that it was just some sort of temporary, human-made thing going on top of the mountain, something happened. Before our eyes, one of the orbs slowly descended below the backside of the mountain and out of sight. I am sorry, I know I am no aeronautical engineer or anything, but I know what a helicopter looks like when it descends in elevation. This was not like that at all. It sunk down and out of sight in less than just a few seconds, very smoothly, all without making any lateral movement whatsoever. We were stunned, but before we had time to wallow in this feeling or think that we could have possibly seen something unnatural, the other orb took off from its position. It did not gain or lose any elevation. It just took off horizontally at breakneck speed and began to make its way around the edge of the lake. It was not until the light was about halfway between its starting point and our position that we began to consider that it might be heading straight for us. We stood still at the shore and followed the objects with our eyes. Out of sheer curiosity and without speaking, we both made an unconscious decision to wait and see what would happen. I mean, what else were we supposed to do? At no point did we talk or look at each other. We just stood there, watching. Without leaving you in suspense for too long, the object did eventually arrive to where we were, and upon its arrival, it slowed to a crawl and crept over us at a snail's pace. It was big. Not stereotypically mothership big, but big. I do not know exactly, but if I had to estimate, I would say it was about 50 meters in length by 30 meters in width. It was shaped like a fat cigar and had two or three rows of orange lights on its bottom. I cannot tell you what my friend was doing or how he was reacting at this time, for I was entranced. I remember thinking that I had never had an opportunity to view something like this, and I probably would never get another chance again. It was a once-in-a-lifetime experience, so I stared intensely, examining anything and everything about it that I could. 
unfortunately. There were not many details that I could make out, only its approximate dimensions and the rows of lights. It made no real sounds aside from what I perceived to be a very, very faint humming. There were no beams of light shooting down at us or anything like that. We stood in the pitch blackness of the late New Hampshire night, and I remember preparing myself for something to happen to us. But as far as I know, nothing ever did. As soon as it had crept its way past us, it took off as fast as it had appeared, up into the night sky and out of sight. At that point, I shot my head back across the lake towards the mountain. There was nothing but the normal, flashing red light remaining. All appeared to be back to normal. I do not think we said anything to each other aside from, let's get out of here, or something to that effect, before grabbing what little we had brought with us and hightailing it back to my friend's car. We drove the 30 miles back to our hometown, purchased some snacks at the convenience store, and returned to his house where we proceeded to set up the same beach chairs that we had brought with us to the lake in his backyard, where we stayed up for most of the night, talking about what the hell we had just seen. For the next few weeks, my mind had hardly focused on anything else. I told my parents at some point, but they sort of just laughed it off, telling me that it must have been a helicopter or something like that. And after their reaction, I decided not to tell anyone else. Not until I was older and gave no crap about what people would think of me. It was only then that I began to tell my trusted friends about what happened that night. My friend and I have since parted ways. We live across an ocean from each other now and talk from time to time. In fact, it has been a few years since one of us brought it up. However, sitting here and writing this down, it just now made me want to reach out and talk with him again. I know what I saw, and it was not constructed by humanity. We do not have that sort of technology. At least, not that we know of. And if we do, there is far more hidden from the average citizen of the earth than I thought possible. But I am digressing into conspiracy theories now, and that is a path that I try not to go down. The fact is that the possibility that we are alone in the universe is so microscopically small. Consider this, there are billions of planets out there that are much, much older than Earth. All it would take is one of them to have developed intelligent life a few million years before us, giving them a massive head start in the development and technology scheme that would allow them to create machines that could do what these objects are. Thank you for sharing my story, Swamp Dweller. I hope you enjoyed it. So, this was a four-day stay in a cabin in the woods in Wisconsin, on blue-green property. I cannot for the life of me remember the exact cabin, but I think it was 413. No promises, though. Right away when I was alone, this was a trip with my mother, it felt like I was not on my own. I am normally hard to shake, but I could not bear being alone, as I felt like I was being watched by something. Both my mother and I checked the cabin thoroughly, but never found anything. The first night, I heard what sounded like footsteps on what would be the room above me, but the cabin was one floor with a slanted roof, so it could not have made any sense to have been someone. It sounded like a small child running across the length of the slanted roof, and both I and my mother heard it. For our peace of mind, we went over to the neighbor cabin. The cabins were divided into two suites, one on the right, one on the left, but we quickly discovered it was vacant, so we went back to our own. The next morning, I awoke to find my clothes, including the ones I fell asleep in. I get cold easily, so I tend to have pajamas on, and I had a hoodie on as well. I had on pajama pants, and they were much bigger than me. They were hand-me-downs and tied well around with one string, so I find it a bit hard to believe I would have untied them while I was asleep. They were all thrown about the room, and it took me a good five minutes to find the shirt I had on, which was tangled up in the sheets. Maybe I just got hot and took it off while I was asleep, but I am from a warm place and have never done that before, so part of me doubts I took off my own clothes. Even if I did, it would not have explained how the clothes that were in my suitcase in the far corner of the room were scattered about. I am typically a bit of a neat freak, and never would I have ever been able to sleep if I knew my clothes were thrown everywhere. Later that same day, I was alone once more as my mother had run out to get some food from a nearby restaurant. I heard breathing from the next room over, which would have been my mother's bathroom. I brushed it off as nothing, but then I remembered I was in the cabin alone, so I called my mom and told her to get back here quickly, and then I listened. It sounded far too rhythmic, 
to have been the air conditioner, and I could have sworn I could hear clear exhales and inhales. The layout of the cabin was simplish, so I will try to describe it to the best of my ability. There was a living room when you first walk in, and a closet with a washer and dryer that we never really used, and a kitchen. Then down the hall, perpendicular to the kitchen, were the bedrooms and the bathrooms. One was outside of the respective bedroom, and larger than the other bathroom, and the bedroom at the end of the hall had a bathroom hanging off of it. Go back to the living room, and there is also a balcony, which is protected from the wind by the other suite that was vacant, and our own suite, and there was a bathroom through a thick wall from the balcony. Hopefully, that all made sense. It will be important later. Once my mom was back, I remember getting up from the table in the living room and headed to my bathroom, and I swore I saw something in my bathroom. So I backed up and checked, and there was nothing there. I thought I saw a lady dressed in all white, cliche I know, and she had vanished. So I decided that I was just going crazy and went to the bathroom. Nothing happened to me the rest of the day. So I will skip to the third day. It was the day the running on the roof got extremely prominent, as though a child was running back and forth. Once again, that would have made no sense as the suite next to ours was vacant. We even called the front desk and asked them to call the suite next to us to tell them to quiet it down some. And they themselves said there's nobody in that cabin. And the roof was slanted quite a bit. At around 2 p.m., I looked up from my laptop. I was sitting in the corner as opposed to being on the couch. And I swear, I saw a woman who didn't fit my mother's body type staring at me through the window's reflection. As in she was inside the cabin, watching me using the reflection. And I even got a picture of it. I may eventually send that into the show. I don't want to be ridiculed for it though. For reference, my mother is rather large. The woman I saw was clear, not the outlines of the curtain, and she was thinner, still overweight but not by much, in the long white gown of who I thought I saw in my room the other day. They looked to have a romantic tuck and messed up face, and they were much taller than me. For reference, I am a 4'10 guy and did not have a dress packed, and neither did my mother. Plus, I was sitting down and out of the reflection, so I knew it couldn't have been me, and the dress went out some, and the curtains did not. So, I don't know what could have caused the reflection. Half of why I'm here. I want to know a decent answer for the woman in the reflection, as it didn't look entirely like a woman or a human for that matter. It seemed more humanoid and in a dress than a woman in a dress. The final night there, I was exhausted and did not really sleep well the night prior, and I went to bed at about 8.30. I got up before I ever fell asleep and went to the living room as I felt something hit my foot. It felt long and hard, almost like a round pole. I told my mother this, and she told me that on the first night she felt like something tried to push her off the bed, and it felt very cold and hard. We talked for about 20 or 30 minutes about it, and eventually, I laid back down and nothing happened for the rest of the trip. So, to recap, there was running across the roof on nights 1 through 3. Night 1, my mom apparently felt something try to push her out of bed. Day 2, I woke up to find every article of clothing, including what I had on, was thrown around the room. More roof running, seeing something in my bathroom, and a weird breathing from an empty room, and loud breathing I heard it through the wall. Day 3, a weird reflection of a woman that looked like her face was damaged in the window, and night 4, I felt like I was hit by something cold. I also want to include that nothing in the cabin felt evil per se, more mischievous and almost felt motherly at times, granted misguided. But I am pagan, so maybe my mind is a bit off on detecting these kind of things. And according to my mother, nothing felt evil, just off and ultimately creepy. The trip, again, was only me and my mother. I really need your guys' opinion on this. I believe in some occult things, but cannot provide a solid yes or no as if I believe in ghosts or not. I am looking for an answer, be it paranormal or not. Thank you, Swamp Dwellers. I hope you guys can help me. It was about late November in Colorado, and I was about seven or eight years old. My father had the great idea of taking us all for a weekend to a cabin that he was going to rent. 
My mother thought it was a great idea for me, my sister, my father, and my mother to bond. So that's exactly what happened. We rented a cabin for a few days. We took off school on Friday to get a head start on getting there, which I had no issue with. We got there and it was sure cold. Well, it was almost December so I guess it made sense that it was so cold. Anyway, we got all set up and decided where we would all sleep. We ate dinner and then we all got set up for bed and were thinking about what we would do tomorrow. We got there kind of late so we couldn't do too much on the first day. That night though, I heard noises outside. It sounded kind of like footsteps. I looked out the window and saw nothing of note, so I figured it must have been an animal or something. I tried my very best to go back to sleep, and somewhere around 15 minutes later, I heard it again. This time though, I made sure to wake my sister up. She was about 11 at the time, and she heard it as well. We both walked over to the window and saw something out there. We weren't quite sure what it was. We decided it was best for it not to see us, so we went back to sleep. I had a hard time sleeping that night and so did my sister, but when we eventually woke up, my mother was inside making breakfast and my father was outside. I asked my mom if I could go outside with my dad and she told me sure while my sister stayed inside and waited for her breakfast. I walked outside and my father was talking to some man, a sort, a short chubby man. He had a shaved head and was wearing a veteran cap. He looked really nervous too for some reason. He was sweating a lot, even though it was freezing outside. I walked over to him and my father looked at me and said, oh, this is my son, and told him my name. The man looked at me and said, nice to meet you kid, my name's Patrick. He smiled and looked at me. I smiled and greeted him back. It may have been rude at the time, but I was just a kid. And I asked him, you look kind of scared. Are you alright? He kind of coughed and replied, Yeah, I'm fine. Just went through shell shock. I'm a veteran. He said, as I couldn't tell already with the cap he was wearing. He seemed rather normal at the time. My father seemed to really like this guy, and I liked him at first too. He told my father he had also rented a cabin with his family, and that they were really close to us, and he decided to introduce himself. My father invited him inside for breakfast, and he stayed and it was seemingly normal. I went outside to play after that with my father and Patrick. While outside, I fell and scraped my knee and started crying. My father was inside at the time, a bad time for him to be inside. My mother was calling for him, and he ran inside while I was out there with Patrick. Patrick ran over to me and told me to come to his cabin, because he had band-aids. I agreed and went with him. I wasn't a very smart kid. I went with Patrick. We talked about what I liked doing and I told him about video games that I played and stuff like that. Then, things got weird. He asked me what shoe size I was and how old I am. I didn't know what my shoe size was. I told him, but I, I told him my age. He just kind of chuckled and said something along the lines of, good to know. Also, his cabin was nowhere near ours. It was way back. It took about 20 to 25 minutes to walk there. I was tired and there was no point in getting abandoned anymore, but I still decided to keep going since I had walked so long. We entered the cabin and he told me to go in first, so I did. As soon as I walked in, I realized something. There was nobody in there. No family. I asked him where his family was and he didn't answer, pretending like he didn't hear. He locked the door. I then kind of got frightened. He told me, I'll be right back with a band-aid, kiddo. He walked into the kitchen and pulled one out of somewhere, and then walked back and told me to have a seat and he put it on. I sat down and he put it on me. He also held my leg in his other hand and rubbed it down and told me, You're rather muscular, kid. I like that. I got kind of scared and immediately stood up. He asked me what was wrong and I told him nothing and that my leg was feeling much better. I then thought my parents must be worried sick and I should hurry back. He insisted that I stay longer and ate there. I didn't want to, but I was alone and if I ran, I don't think I could have found my way back to the cabin. The door was locked too, so I just agreed and decided to eat with him and get it over with fast. He asked how much I weighed, and I guessed around 73 pounds. He then had a smile across his face. He nodded and said, Perfect weight. I asked him why it was perfect weight. He just kept smiling. I was really weirded out and asked him if I could go. 
He said no, and that things were just getting started, and I shouldn't miss out on the fun. He had such a weird tone when he said that. I then heard a big bang come from the bedroom. It was a closed door. Patrick stood up and looked kind of angry. He walked into the room and shut the door behind him. I then heard him yelling, Did I freaking tell you that you could move? No, so stay the hell where you are. I have company. Or something like that. He then walked out with a smile on his face and shut the door slowly. Sorry about that. It was just my wife. She was really sick and not allowed to be near visitors today. He was smiling while saying that. I wanted to go. I then looked around the room and noticed there were clothes everywhere and it was really messy. He must have been living out of here. At that moment, his wife walked out of the room. I'm hungry, she said. He looked pissed. Get back in there, he said. His wife was extremely pale and looked like she had been crying a lot. She was sniffling and had red circles around her eyes. She looked at me, then walked back in the room. I asked him where his kids were. He didn't answer. He told me he had kids clothes that he wanted me to try on. That was the last straw. I had to get out of the situation, but I didn't know how to. I started crying and then he hugged me. He told me, it'll be okay little one, nothing is going to happen. Just try on these clothes. He walked in the back room. I thought that was the perfect time for me to leave. I unlocked his door and tried to leave as quietly as I could. I didn't care if I got lost anymore. I didn't want to take the chances with Patrick, if that was even his name. I had a feeling that he had been lying. He lied about having kids, who knows what else. I was in the woods trying to find my way back. I was still close to his house, close enough to hear shouting. I heard him yelling stuff to his wife. Things along the lines of, where the F did I go, and I knew I shouldn't have left him alone. Stuff like that. I could have sworn I heard him call her a bunch of names that I don't want to repeat. Then, it happened. I stopped in my tracks, I heard footsteps. I went and hid behind a tree and looked in his direction. He was outside and he seemed to be looking for me. I was far enough away to where I could barely see him, but I could tell he was looking for something. He then stepped out into the forest and I heard him shouting, Hey kid, it's okay, you can come back now, you don't have to try on the clothes. I have toys in the back of my cabin, if you want to come play with them, just come back. I then ran. I ran as fast as I could in a straight line in hopes I would find my family. I was running away and I thought I heard shouting, but I didn't stop to hear it. Then, after about an hour of running, I saw a cabin. My cabin. I ran to it. My father was outside looking around for me. I ran up to him crying and told him Patrick wasn't a good guy, and that he really was weird and he was touching my legs and stuff. My father immediately called the person he rented the cabin from, and he said that nobody had rented that cabin. My father looked at me and told me to never follow any stranger ever again. We immediately left that day and asked for a refund for the next day. The guy renting them out apologized. The man, having the cabin rentals, called the police and the police went back there and checked the cabin, and there was nobody there, not even his wife. His clothes and belongings were still there, is what they told us. Nothing really happened after that. They asked questions and left. They never called us or told us anything about him ever again. Patrick most likely wasn't his real name, and he probably wasn't a veteran. I just want to know what happened to him and his wife, and how he even got a wife in the first place, and how and why he lived in that cabin. He seemed to have been living there for a while. I guess he left because he figured the police would be coming after him because he didn't rent the cabin. So many questions that will likely never get answered. I'm just glad that it's all over. I used to go to the mountains every year, multiple times if fate would allow it. There's something so peaceful about feeling isolated from the rest of the world. I don't have to look down at my phone and worry about bills or keeping up with my friends. For a brief window of time, it's just me and what the world has created. Every year, I would visit the town of Estes and stay overnight so I could grab an early start and avoid as many people as possible. It had gotten to the point where I was recognized and formed friendships with some of the locals. Most anyone working at the diners where I got some fuel before heading up the mountain probably knew who I was. My car and I would traverse the Trail Ridge Road, 
stopping on the viewpoints along the road, I would observe the wildlife. Rolling green would lay out in front of me, dotted with the remnants of snowfall. I would make sure to stop at every given opportunity and take a few good breaths to slowly acclimate myself to the higher altitude and lower intake of oxygen. That's what I used to do anyways. I haven't been back there in a few years now. I think it was three years ago now that it happened. It's hard to keep track anymore. I try not to think about it too much. I've had issues with the memories popping back up without much cause and sending me into a fit. My chest gets all tight and it's hard to breathe. I swear, whatever happens, I can hear its footsteps. But I'm getting ahead of myself. My therapist that I started seeing following the event told me it might be a good idea to get it out, write it on paper, or tell people my story. So that's what this is. I have no idea if something like this will help, but at this point I'll try anything. I'd love to finish telling my story and be able to get an uninterrupted night's sleep. So, three years ago, like I said, if I ever got the opportunity I would go back multiple times in a year and, as fate had it, that was such a year. I had a decent chunk of vacation time saved up at work, so I decided to take an extra holiday for myself. Everything went about as you'd expect. It was warmer than normal, as I try to go in the quarter months usually. I got into town the same as always. I booked nearly the same room in the same hotel as the last time I visited and threw my stuff into the hotel room. Before heading to bed, I made sure to plot out my intended traveling so I could show someone where I was planning to go. I had been there so many times, and as beautiful as everything was, I liked to try and go off the beaten path when I could. In the event something happened to me, I wanted people to know where I was. That's exactly what I did the next morning. I was greeted by the workers at the local diner and made sure to show them the map, telling them when I expected to return. With enough fuel to get me through most of the day, I headed out. The first place I wanted to go was a decent drive up Trail Ridge Road, Lulu City, a place I was surprised that I'd never gotten around to visiting. Pulling onto the side of the road, I sat at the shoulder looking at the elevation between me and the town, a town that had diminished into a small portion of the horizon. Turning the car off and locking it, I was pleasantly surprised to find myself alone on the trail. The fewer people that were around me, the more connected to the environment I could feel. It's like when you watch a movie in the theater. You're so much more immersed when it's quiet. Just a few chattering conversations can taint the entire experience. They say with hindsight, it's much easier to see the red flags. When I think back though, it's hard for me to tell where my first sign to turn back really was. You'll hear a lot of sounds walking through the forest and sounds travel pretty far. So it's hard to say what's unusual and what isn't. Even if you've heard something hundreds of times, it can sound alien. I remember as I was walking the trail, I heard what sounded like several booms from a distant thunder. The noise happened in rapid succession, like the beating of drums, though the weather hadn't called for such noises. At the time, I thought it could have just been the snapping of a nearby tree and the resulting noise of it was smacking into the ground. I ignored it and continued on my path, feeling the mountain air fill my lungs surrounded by trees, all by myself. There was the occasional skittering of wildlife. I even came across a large print in the middle of the trail. I assumed it to be a bear as black bears have been spotted near the trail. It's a nearly four mile hike which isn't all that bad as the elevation didn't climb too much. Around two hours after I had initially set out, I found myself looking at the old sign for Lulu City, an old mining town that had been abandoned in the 1800s. I walked slowly through the place. There were old cabins around the area and various plots of land that once served as foundations for more homes. It was incredible to sit in a ghost town nestled near the Rocky Mountains. It was almost as if the place had pushed them out. From the little research I had done, it seemed like the profit margin for the silver they were mining just wasn't enough to justify the town. Though, knowing what I know now, I can't help but wonder if something else was at play 
all those years ago. I looked around for a while at the large open area where the town used to sit. There were around 40 cabins at the town's prime. All that remained were the remnants of three, a few building sites, and a sign for the town. Citing the population was at 200 people. I sat down for a moment, leaning my back against the tree, looking at the area surrounding me, pouring some water down my throat, I watched the tree line. There was this creeping sensation you get when someone is staring at the back of your head. I felt that, but it was like I knew where the feeling was coming from, but I couldn't quite see it. As I was focused on an area of trees where the paranoia was stemming from, I noticed a shadow moving. I had thought at first it was just a dark area where the sun had difficulty getting through. As the shadow shifted, however, it was revealed there was just a dark mass blocking my view. My initial reaction was to just assume the figure was a black bear or an elk, but it was hard to convince myself of that as the shadow reached far too high off the ground. Either way, I just sat and watched. I wasn't about to call any attention to myself, especially if my initial reaction was correct. I had bear mace and the likes, but if I could avoid using it, I would rather do that. With the shadow retreating into the woods, I stood slowly from my spot and decided to exit Lulu. As I turned around, I heard a familiar cracking of trees. This time, however, the sound continued for a good minute or two. It was as if the drums of war had been rung and a warning was shooting through the mountain. I wondered if anyone on the other trails were able to hear the noise as it was so loud that it made me cover my own ears. As I started retreating from the noise, it stopped and as I reached the exit to Lulu City, I saw a shadow once more. This time it was much closer to me. I was able to make out more about it. Part of its dark structure being the antlers atop its head. They weren't the same, jagged and pointy antlers that decorated the indigenous elk around Rocky Mountain. They were more solid, resembling that of a moose's. They were much larger than any pair I'd seen before though, large enough to shovel the snow out of the driveway in one go. I backed up a bit, hearing the foliage bending and cracking under my footsteps. I honestly did not know how to approach the situation because I did not know what I was looking at. The thing was still shaded by the trees and I couldn't make out its body structure other than it being massive. I wonder how something of that size was able to move so quickly through the trees. Then I caught a glimpse of the eyes it was using to watch me. It was only when shreds of light reflected off of them. The first two shimmering orbs appeared from under its antlers and then to my shock, another set of lights fainter than the ones of above them appeared. It was uncanny. Looking at something with such a familiar shape, yet I couldn't decipher what the thing was or what it wanted from me. I didn't want to keep staring, in case it took direct eye contact as a threat. Averting my gaze, I listened to the creature stumbling around before the commotion caused by their movements dissipated into the foreground. With the noise of that thing distant, I turned back and saw no sight of the thing. I decided it was best to leave the area quickly and quietly. I thought the thing might consider Lulu City its territory and was giving me a stern warning. I started walking back ready for the easy hike. Watching the dirt path at my feet, I came across a fresh footprint. It was massive. Putting my foot into it revealed that my foot didn't even make up half the size of one of its toes. The thing was massive and heavy. I didn't want to call my trip short, so as I walked the trail back to my car, I thought of just going to the next spot ahead of schedule. I always try to end my visits by looking out over Bear Lake. It's just so pristine, it's hard to ignore. I kept my eyes on the trees the whole time, making sure that some hulking shadow wasn't lurking. Before I knew it, I was exiting the trail and climbing into my car. With a hum, and the vehicle sprang back to life. It wasn't too long before I had gotten to as far as my car would take me before I had to stop and walk the rest of the way. Surprisingly, once again I found myself alone. There were a few other cars where I parked, but once I got to the lake, I didn't see anyone else on the trails. It felt like everyone had been scared off. 
Bear Lake is normally a pretty popular spot for people visiting. I had the feeling like I was missing something, like everyone else got a memo that I didn't. I sat for a while on a large boulder by the side of the lake, watching the winds ripple small patterns over the smooth surface of the water. It wasn't often you could go there and not hear the howling of screaming children and their parents, so I intended to soak as much of it in as I could. As I sat there, I could see the line of trees on the other side of the lake. The tops of them created an ocean of green that only surrendered to the peaks behind them. I watched that ocean of green sway like a hurricane was sweeping through them. The treetops moved and buckled as I heard familiar smacking noises begin to get louder. The realization dawning on me that whatever I had seen before wasn't warning me. It had been following me and continued to do so as I left the site. I had driven there though. I thought it would be impossible for that thing to be able to have made it here so quickly. With the shifting of the treetops getting closer, I slowly rose to my feet when I saw something eject from the top of the trees. It hung in the air for a moment before crashing down into the lake before me. It was brief, but I saw the object enough to know that the thing had flung a rock rather large, probably bigger than my body, like it was nothing. I started stepping backward when my ankle rolled on a rock and I fell backward crashing to the ground. My elbow made contact with the hard surface, pulling apart the fabric of my sweater and slicing through my skin. I opened the small first aid kit I had brought with me, hearing the thunderous noise getting closer. I poured my drinking water onto the wound and wrapped it with a bandage. As I finished tending to the small wound, I noticed that the noise had halted. Slowly ignoring the pain in my ankle, in the stinging on my elbow, I looked over the rock to see. The trees were no longer swaying, only moving with a gentle push of the wind. That's when I heard a noise to my right. A huff. Turning slowly, avoiding sudden movements, I saw the beast that had been watching me. I saw it bathed in the sun. Every detail. This thing was some twisted amalgamation. It dwarfed me in size. I could have been twice as tall and still not met it eye to eye. I did not know what I was supposed to do if I was supposed to run or stay still. I watched its pitch black fur ruffle as it took a step towards me, offering another huff out of the bear shaped nose. Its whole head reminded me of a bear, except for the angular structure around its eyes that looked more like a buck. Four stern and focused eyes, all of varying shades of amber, peered toward me. Its body, again, was reminiscent of a bear that had a bizarre length to it, almost like its belly was dragging against the dirt. If it wasn't for the massive paws pushing down into the ground, the thing would topple over. It moved its head back and forth, shaking its whole body. Small clicking groans emitted from the open jaw a jawline with thick and sharp teeth. My reasoning was starting to go out the window, and the urge to just run and get the heck out of there was mounting by the moment. I was backing away and had noticed I was making it back to the trail, but the creature matched my movements. We were both surrounded by trees and the thing started moving its head side to side, smacking its large antlers onto the nearby trees. As it did, the tree's bark ripped free, exposing lighter tones. As close as I was, the smashing of the massive antlers against the trees was like a shotgun going off next to your ear. It caused me to hold my hands over my ears as I tried to back away. I wanted to run, but the moment I put too much pressure on my ankle, I knew I would buckle, so all I could do was continue to back away hopping and just hope that it wouldn't charge. It just kept walking forward, smacking one tree after another like it was trying to intimidate me. I watched amazed as if its large frame bulldozed through the trees like it was nothing. I don't know what I did to upset it more than I already had, but the clicking noise from its mouth picked up and it charged at me. The ground was trembling under the thing's footsteps and before I had time to process what was happening, an antler made contact with me. The memories get all foggy from there. I remember being shunted to the side, my legs colliding with a tree, and I spun out into the bush. Nearly unconscious, I laid surrounded by dirt and leaves as the bear-like creature approached me. It smelled me, 
interested particularly in the blood spilling out of my legs where the bones had broken on impact. I got a good look at its eyes before I passed out. One was a set of eyes that you'd expect to see on a mammal, while the others were more lizard-like. Those eyes were the last thing I saw before passing out. It was a miracle I ever made it out of there. Some other visitors had heard the commotion and headed over to find me passed out. They stopped my bleeding and got me to the hospital in Estes. I wish I could go hiking still. I'm not afraid of running into that thing again, but my legs were beyond repair and I haven't been able to walk ever since. I still think about that creature. I did as much research as I could but never found anything that looked like that thing. Some monstrous combination of a bear and elk. I wondered if that was the real reason Lulu City was abandoned. Maybe. I was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. I don't think I'll ever know. Sometimes, I hear the clicking noises it made. Every thunderstorm I hear makes me think about the creature bashing its head into the trees. Maybe it did that as a show of strength, like when bucks smack their antlers together. I don't want to believe that's true though, because I couldn't imagine what a behemoth like that needs to prove its strength to. What other secrets could the Rocky Mountains contain? Are there more of those things there, or perhaps another manner of beast? Every night I go to sleep. I look out my window. I think of those four eyes peering at me through the dark, waiting to finish what they started. I'm not sure if I'll ever feel better having written this all out. Reading it as I go, I almost don't believe it myself. Maybe I'll feel better if I just convince myself nothing ever happened. That I just fell and tumbled hard enough to crack the bones in my legs like twigs. Maybe then, I'll be able to get some sleep.